This is a view from the bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. What do you get when you cross Star Trek, Battlestar Galactica, and uh, I'll have to take the author's word for this because I'm not familiar with Warhammer, and Warhammer 40,000. That will be the subject of our program tonight. Welcome to A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. Also this evening, in the second half of the program, I'm going to talk more about the Russo-Ukrainian War uh, in terms of how do we process this. Uh, a very relevant question asked by Bill Maher, who seems to be asking more and more relevant and uncomfortable questions for progressives today, these days. And uh, we'll go a little deeper into why Russia is not the land of Gog, of Magog. Um Apparently, my program last week attracted some attention from some Bible prophecy teachers, and I, I mean them no ill will. I'm open to discussing this and uh, the possibility that I'm wrong, although I don't think I am. But we'll talk about that in the second half of the program again as well, why Russia is not Gog of Magog. But first, we get to our guest this evening, who uh, it's far too long. Uh, I should have had him on this program years before. Besides his own work as an author and editor, he's the man who's made uh, our fiction, Sharon's and mine, look really, really good when you buy the books or look at the uh, the Kindle versions. He's done all the layout work on the interior for the Red Wings saga and my two novels, Iron Dragons and The God Conspiracy. And so we are well, you know, honored to welcome here uh, the the author of a new trilogy called Starship Gilead, Book One: Relics of Utopia. Books two and three due to come out very very shortly. Prodigal and the Last Battlefield. We welcome John Graves to the program. Uh, John, before we jump into the conversation here, I want to um, maybe touch on a topic that uh, came out of the blue and kind of sent you for a loop here recently. Uh, should I call you John or should I call you Kevin? Well, my. My real name is Kevin G. Summers, and um, I, I guess I'll elaborate on what you're talking about here. Uh, in January, I was canceled by Amazon. Um, the story is they accused me of having multiple KDP accounts. KDP is Kindle Direct Publishing, they, um, their arm for publishing self-published stories. And um, I don't. I don't have multiple accounts. I never have. And... Um, this all came down right before I was about to release a uh, space opera that we're about to talk about. And, um, oh my goodness, it, uh, it was devastating. Um, I didn't know what to do if I should release under my name or if my name was uh, poison there. I, I felt like John Proctor in the crucible, you know, I've given you my soul, believe me, my name. And, uh, ultimately my publisher and I decided to, to launch it under a pen name. And, um, now you know what the G stands for. It's Graves. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, okay. Here I am. So uh, I've, I've I've gone through the range of emotions. I don't know what happened, and they won't talk. They've totally ghosted me. So, um, yeah, my real name is Kevin, but uh, the book is out under the name John Graves. And, and you had a number of published novels under your name, Kevin G. Summers, that have just disappeared from Amazon. Sharon and I were looking for that again today. And uh, one I had started reading, and I was in, really engrossed in it, and then I got distracted by a shiny object that was uh, Bleak December. And the, uh, the, the, the tease for your book, The Legendarium, looked really interesting, but I never found the time to read it. Now I, I wanted to go back and read it because I, I've read the first of the three, uh, the first of the trilogy of your Starship Gilead series and really enjoyed it, which is why I was like, why haven't I had Kevin on this program before? Excuse me, John. Um, <laughs> and, and now Amazon doesn't have him anymore. But for an independent author, which is essentially what Sharon and I are as far as our fiction goes, um, we, we've released our novels uh, with, and I, I pointed out in the introduction that uh, you've done all the interior layout and, and it just makes them look really professional, which is a huge, it's huge because people, when they, they try something new, if it's an author, they don't know. And the interior looks like it was done on Microsoft Word um, by somebody who doesn't really understand uh, that you've got to leave a little extra space in the middle for the page, you know, th things like that, that, that you understand as a layout guy. Um, it, you know, it, it's, it's. This kind of thing that could happen to us, and suddenly the Red Wing saga suddenly just disappears. You know, uh, it's like it's gone. Yeah. Wow. Did they give you any option to appeal? Yeah, no, there's no appeal. Um, basically, it was this almost a form email, and um, you know, it basically said, "Sorry, uh, you're gone," and there's nothing you can do about it, and you can never come back. And um, you know. 
they they did leave up my books that were out through other publishers through pocket books and you know various other anthologies and things that i was in but nothing that i self-published is is available anymore i can get it back out there through barnes and noble and apple books and other sources but you know that the majority of books that are sold in this right, country are right. sold through Amazon. I mean, a, a staggering number. And, you know, if you don't have that audience, you can write books, but you're probably not going to sell a lot of them unless you have a publisher. So we're right back to the gatekeepers of publishing right. that we had in the 90s. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Amazon kind of overturned the apple cart when it came to the big publishers determining who would get into stores and uh, who would just be, you know, eternally a starving artist. Now, Amazon has become that gatekeeper. Yes, they have. So, yeah, it was uh, devastating. But, you know, the truth is, um, whatever happens with my books, I have kids. I have a wife. I have a family. And the first thing that I have to do is teach them the lesson of what do you do when you get kicked in the dirt? What do you do when you fall off the horse? And... I mean, part of me wants to quit. Part of me wants to just go cry in the corner, but I can't because I have to show my kids that if you fall off the horse, you get back up on the horse again and you have to fight it. So here I am. My name is gone. It's not on the book anymore, but, um, you know, I'll get those old books back out one of these days and I'm just going to press forward with a a new name and a new uh, voice and just look at it, you know. God moves in mysterious ways, yeah. and maybe this is for the best. So um, I don't know why, I don't know how, but I'm going to move forward, and that's the future. Well, Sharon had a similar story that uh, I won't go into here, but uh, with her first series of novels, uh, including the Armageddon Strain, Winds of Evil, and, and so on, and uh, we, we finally, I think, are going to get back around to putting those out. But uh, we're also going to be talking to you about how we get out to uh, like Barnes & Noble and uh, Apple so that uh, we're diversified in case Amazon gets uh, gets kind of weird. Let's let's jump to Starship Gilead. This w- when I saw the promotional material for this, and, and of course we've had a, a bunch of contact over the last five years or so. As Sharon has been uh, publishing the the Red Wing saga, which has attracted some really um, really strong critical reviews and some really interesting uh, fans. Uh, this past weekend, I was speaking at a little weekend retreat conference, uh, and a retired FBI agent and a retired Navy pilot, <laughs> both, you know, men, alpha guys, you know, uh, landing on a carrier at night. Not for me, thank you. But both of them, both of them saying, when is book eight of the Red Wing saga coming? Because they're hooked on Sharon's novels. And again, you've got a big part in that for the uh, the way that the interior looks. But when when I saw the promotional material for the Starship Gilead trilogy and the the tease, perfect for fans of Star Trek, Battlestar, Star Trek, Battlestar Galactica, both of those are in my top ten as far as especially the reboot of Battlestar Galactica, and Warhammer Forty Thousand, which I'm not familiar with, but I would say you know no, it's. I, to, I don't think. But but to me it, it was it was like, if I had to describe it, it's Battlestar Galactica meets the Book of Enoch. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I am. Um, I'm a big fan of yours, Derek. Um, I uh, started following PID Radio on about episode ten, maybe. Oh my goodness! Back in two thousand five. Um, yeah, um, you know, it was like one of the first episodes. You were one of the first podcasts that was out there, right? That's and, true. Um, I can't even profess what an amount of uh, influence um, <laughs> that has had on me, and you know, your show led to. Um, reading Dr. Michael Heiser and, and, you know, the unseen realm and those books. And, um, you know, that material is so meaningful to me. And and I hope you don't mind. I'm going to divert for a second here. Um, back in the nineties, I was, um, I was at a point in my life when I, I had grown up as a Christian and I had fallen away and I was not interested in God, in the church, in the Bible at all. I was interested in Star Trek. And I loved Star Trek. I, I love it. Yeah. And what happened is I had watched all these movies that were done. The series was over, right? And I'd read all the novels. And um, I was the best one everybody knows is Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, which is full of references to Moby Dick. Mm-hmm. And so 
I, I, after I watched that movie for 500 times, I was like, what am I going to do? I, why don't I read Moby Dick? I read it and it's great. Maybe the greatest American novel. I did not understand the Bible references in Moby Dick. And so after a little while, I thought, well, shoot, I'll read the Bible for its literary value. I read it for the literary value and I, I read through it and it, it spoke to me. It, God spoke to me, he moved through that reading, but I would have never read the Bible if it wasn't for Moby Dick. And I would not have read Moby Dick if it wasn't for Star Trek. Mm -hmm. So like what we read in books is really powerful to us. And the one place when I read through the Bible as a non-Christian um, that really struck me was the conquest of the land of Canaan. And I could not parse how, you know, the God of, you know, Jesus and mercy and love and forgiveness could go into all these cities and kill everybody when men, women, and children, it did not make sense to me. And I had a physical, you know, Bible that had a note that said, you know, who, who are these, um, you know, the, the sons of God, what is, what is that about? And they're the, you know, the, the sons of Seth, this whole treatment of the old Testament you know, eradicating the supernatural worldview, it bothered me. And I struggled for several years after that before I finally, you know, got saved. But um, this was the hangup point for me, was was this story, the Watchers, you know, the Nephilim, the conquest of Cain and the giants in the land, Og, and, you know, all of those those pieces. And it really wasn't until, you know, I started, you know, listening to your show, reading Dr. Michael Heiser's books, and, um, you know, understanding, wait, there's something else going on here. These stories mean so much to me. And I think that, you know, you know, we run in circles where people know them, but I think there's a lot of Christians out there that don't know them. Oh, absolutely. There's a lot of secular people out there that don't, don't know them at all. You know, all they hear is, you know, God sent his army of people in and killed all the people in this town. Well, that doesn't sound like the God that I want to be around. Unless you understand why he did it, right? Who who was there, you know? So to me, that matters so much that um, you know, to get these ideas out there. And of course, in science fiction, you can you can do anything you want. You can explore any idea any which way you want. And so um, I thought, well, shoot, I'm gonna I'm gonna take my interest in this uh, the supernatural worldview of the Bible and stick it into a science fiction setting and see where it takes me. Hmm. Starship Gilead. Uh, again, I, I see a lot of Battlestar Galactica in there. Star Trek to a degree, but it, it, it seemed like the world weary, uh, the, the, you know, rough edges, uh, you know, these are ships that have been around for a while. Uh, the, the, uh, you know, I loved the original series, Star Trek still do. In fact, it was when I was a child watching it, that's where I learned to do this, you know, uh, because Spock would always, you know, fascinating, but Battlestar Galactica, the reboot in, uh, uh, gosh, when did it come back out? 2005, something like that? 2011? And anyway, five, yeah, I think yeah. So. anyway, we, after the turn of the century, the reboot was, the, the production design was so well done and the scripts were so good for the most part that um, I, you know, I thought, okay, that is really fantastic. And then when you understand the theology that is woven into it because the original Battlestar Galactica built on Mormon theology, which uh, is still present in the the reboot. But you also get, uh, especially with the uh, the prequel Caprica, you get uh, the the idea of um, transhumanism and where that might ultimately lead. So there are a lot of there's a lot of theology woven in there. Um, the original Trek seemed to shy away from that a bit, except there were, you know, there were a couple of stories like uh, who mourns for Adonai. Um, and, uh, right. Where, where you had these godlike beings, but, uh, oh, well, they're just aliens with exceptional power. But by the time of some of the later series, it was pretty clear that Gene Roddenberry was working some theological themes into Star Trek. Yeah. The, um, the show that really, uh, where they did it the most was deep space nine I'm a Niner. I love that show. It's my favorite one. I love them all, but um, Deep Space Nine is my favorite version of the show. And like, they they explored religion, and you know, 
Christians sometimes struggle with seeing um, religion dissected by other people, right? It, it's hard sometimes to see if it's C.S. Lewis doing it, okay, but if it's other people, not so much. But in that show, they they really did a good job uh, of exploring it. They they were um, they honored the Bajoran religion. They did not make them look stupid um, most of the time. Um, they had the space Karen, of course, that everybody hates her. <laughs> Um, they, you know, they, for the most part, they did a good job of, um, making their religion seem like something worthwhile, something that should be honored and cherished. And, um, even wrapping, you know, Captain Sisko's story into it. I loved what they did with it. I, I love the way that they explored it. And, um, you know, to me that that's what I like to see, you know, I want my, my TV shows and my movies and my books to reflect um, you know, the things that interest me and, and, you know, you, you have these movies that's just about people shooting each other. And if it's with lasers or guns or lightsabers or whatever it is, that's fine. But it, I mean, to me, that doesn't really interest me. You got to give me some, some meat mm -hmm. and, um, you know, DS9, they really did a good job with that. And, uh, back when I was writing under my real name, my very first story I ever sold was a deep space nine short story called Isolation Ward 4, and um, it was about the this psychiatrist. I don't know if you remember the episode where Cisco um, thinks he's a black science fiction writer in the 1950s, and um, ultimately it ends with him going to a psychiatrist. Well, I told the story from the psychiatrist's point of view, and he has he's a white racist in the 1950s, and he, he has this guy, and he reads his stories, and they change him they help him see the world from another point of view they they help him see through the black man's eyes um and they change him over time over the course of of however many years or months that he is with this um you know with this person and the story was very well received it launched my career it was nominated for the nebula i didn't win but that's okay and um so anyway, yeah, I love DS9. It's, yeah. it's uh, my favorite. <laughs> and, and that was back before the Nebula and the Hugo and the other awards got all woke. So that's uh, that's saying something. Right. Um, it it <laughs> had a lot of very interesting characters in it. In fact, all the all the Trek stories, uh, for the most part, the, the older versions, I, I've not watched enough of the newer iterations to uh, have a comment one way or the other. But... Um, it, that's that's good storytelling. You just t basically you put characters that are interesting, believable, and uh, interesting and believable, and you put them in under stress, and then see what happens. Right, and um, you know the all the great books that you love that you grew up reading, all the great stories. That's what they're about. You know, back in the old days, they didn't have special effects to um, you know to to make the movie be about that. It had to be about the characters and the story. And you know, you, you think about. A movie like It's a Wonderful Life, a movie that can make you weep with joy, with grace. Mm -hmm. It's so amazing and powerful. And they didn't do that with special effects. They, their special effects suck in that movie. They did it with the story, with the actors, with the characters. And, you know, to me, that's what I love. You know, the, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, right? Like, yes, yes. There's all this action and there's all this cool stuff. But in the end, it's about the story. It's about the characters. That's what you take away from it. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm, I've tried to do that now. I, I, I'll say that, um, you know, I put my characters through some hell. Um, it's, uh, they don't have an easy time of it. Um, but I think that that reflects, you know, the world we live in, right. It's the spiritual battle that we have. And, um, you know, the idea of Starship Gilead is if you, advance us far into the future and you have spaceships you have starships that people are living on they're the size of a city they've essentially eradicated all of the religions of the world and they've sent them somewhere to some other planet and this is not you know we're not following the christians and the jews and the muslims anymore we're following the people that were left behind mm -hmm. well what kind of world do they live in and does god come and reach into that world does it does it does he reach back? The answer is yes, but how? And um, you know, it's it's a world a world without God is a violent world. We're you know, this is a violent world to begin with, but without him, how much worse is it gonna be, right? Sure. So that's 
the future. It's you know, I, I was pitching it as Star Trek meets Game of Thrones, um, with the you know, not the sex part of Game of Thrones, but the uh, you know, the people fighting for who gets to be the king and you know, betrayals and violence and stuff like that. And um, it, it, you know, so that's uh, that happens. It's there's some darkness in this story, but I mean, that's ultimately what I'm trying to get to is if you have a world that's run by evil, it's going to be an evil world, but can mm-hmm. good people rise up? And if they do, how, you know, how does God come into that world? And it takes some time. Um, I will say uh, that this is not, um, I'm not knocking it, but this is not left behind where, um, you know, you have good guys that are immediately get saved in chapter three and then stop to have an evangelical call every other chapter. That's not, you know, happening here. Um, I, I wrote, I'll say this, that I, um, I wrote it with a secular audience in mind with as broad an audience as possible. Mm-hmm. So I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm running my mouth a lot. No, um, no, no. And I'm, I'm glad you I'm went down this road. I'm glad you went down this road because I think we need more entertainment like this. Uh, there was a uh, a fellow who f- sadly succumbed to uh, COVID last fall, David Villanueva, that we'd uh, become friends with, who was working on a, a, a video game, a very immersive multiplayer video game. Uh, and it was he, he shared with us that this was inspired by the kind of topics that we talk about at Skywatch TV, you know, the work of guys like Tom Horn and Steve Quayle and L.A. Marzulli and the kind of work that uh, Sharon and I have been doing and Mike Heiser. And how do we combine that and put together compelling entertainment that reaches into secular space to draw in people who are otherwise going to turn to secular entertainment that glorifies the bloodshed for its own sake instead of saying, OK, this is the evil part and there is justice in this world, but it's going to come from outside our time-space domain when he intercedes for us. How do you do that, again, without, well, you, you mentioned the Left Behind series. And uh, again, no disrespect to uh, uh, Tim LaHaye or, um, oh, the author whose name I'm forgetting now, uh, very well-known writer in the Jenkins. Christians. Uh, I'm sorry? Jerry B. Jenkins. Jerry B. Jenkins. Thank you. Thank you. I read a number of those back when they came out because it was unique at the time, um, but I kind of got lifted out of the storyline once I started realizing that a lot of the secondary characters were named for baseball players from the 1960s and 70s that I remember seeing playing against the Cubs when I was a kid. It's like, wait a minute, Don Clendenin, he was first baseman for the Mets. What the... So, yeah, I, and, and it, it did become somewhat formulaic in that uh, you're right there were things that didn't seem to make sense from a plausibility factor if they're under the thumb of the the antichrist how is it they can always find an air airplane to you know private plane to carry them where they need to go from it's this you know it, it didn't seem plausible to me um but you create a very realistic world you build a really realistic world in in starship gilead um when when you project forward in in, in this world you you reference game of thrones why why do you think humanity would kind of default back to that um feudal system of lords and serfs well because i think that that's what we always do um you know we've had this experiment with democracy now for 240 years or whatever it's been and um it's been a beautiful thing but we're not the first that have experimented with it. It's happened before in Rome. Mm-hmm. They tried it too. And what happens is, you know, sometimes it works out. In our case, it worked out because we happen to have a bunch of brilliant people all at the same time that all had the same goal. And that goal was to preserve freedom. And whatever you think about Washington and Jefferson and, and company – they they were all on the same page with we want to preserve freedom for a little while and you know Washington the great Cincinnatus that stepped aside his presidency would anybody do that now I mean it's it's crazy <laughs> to think and I'm not just pointing at you know at Biden Trump I mean all of the the presidents that we have now they're not a Washington they're not a Lincoln you know that that would sacrifice themselves their life their everything. For 
the good of of the many. Um, but anyway, I think that when democracy falls, what happens? Well, the Bible tells us that it's not going to be pretty. We're going to, you know, we're going to have something, a one world government. Is that what we're going to have? I don't know. But if we do, who's going to lead it? What is it going to be like? Do you think it's going to be fun? Do you think it's going to be like Gene Roddenberry? I don't think so. I don't think it's going to be that way. I think it's going to be bad for a lot of people. A lot of people are going to die. It's going to be dark. And, you know, we have something special now. And, you know, we're letting it slip through our fingers. And, you know, it's it's a painful thing to see, to be living through, to have young children um, living in that, that world. Um, so, yeah, that's why, uh, you know, I think that we often go back because... You know, we know that the world was divided into nations a long time ago, and over those nations were, you know, gods, kings, lords, something was over them, and they led their people astray, and they want to be back in power again. And, you know, if you're in power, people that are in power want to seize more power, right? And Mm -hmm. it would stand to reason that you know, evil forces that want to be in power would also want more power. So, you know, uh, I've got a lot of stories in my head about this, um, this ship and this series. And, uh, you know, there's this initial trilogy that is a complete story on its own, but if it is worth expanding, um, you know, I'm planning on exploring, continuing to explore more of those ideas. Can I go back to one thing? Sure. Um, I am a huge fan. My hero is Johnny Cash. Mm. And we mm. were talking about um, how, how you approach the secular world. I don't think anyone has done it better than Johnny Cash. You look at the Folsom Prison album. He starts that record with, I shot a man in Reno to watch him die. He's talking about taking cocaine. He's talking about killing women. He's talking about being in prison and all these things and gallows humor. And he ends that record with a sermon. There's a Greystone Chapel here at Folsom. And if you go to that, he, he went into that prison. He took Mother Maybell Carter into that prison. And he spoke to those prisoners where they were in a way they understood, with a language they understood. You know, Johnny wanted to be a gospel singer, but he understood that the way to reach prisoners is talking about crime, talking about being a wanted man, talking about, you know, doing drugs, all these things. And, you know, Johnny lived through it. He he had a dark and troubled life. He ruined yeah. his marriage. Mm-hmm. He cheated on his wife. He did all kinds of pills. But God saved him. He re- rescued him. From that, and um, you know, Johnny used his um, you know his platform to reach into the secular world, and he ended practically every concert with a gospel song or two. And you know, he was always working toward bringing people to God, but he didn't do it through singing, you know, the old rugged cross. I love the old rugged cross, mm-hmm. but you know, there's certain people that it's not going to reach. Right, it's just not. But those people will listen to you know Folsom Prison Blues those people will watch Star Trek those people will watch Game of Thrones and so if we can use those to you know those kind of stories and reach into their minds reach into their hearts and, and plant ideas there then that's how we can get them when I wrote Star Trek I would do this um, convention in Maryland and it was full of Star Trek fans I love Star Trek fans. These are the greatest people in the world. Mm -hmm. They are looking eating just like everybody else. They often do not have, um, you know, the Bible and God and Jesus as the, as the meaning in their life. They filled it up with Gene Roddenberry, Mm -hmm. infinite diversity and infinite combinations. That is their worldview, right? It came from Star Trek. It didn't come Karl Marx. It didn't come from Eugene Debs, it came from Star Trek, from Gene Roddenberry's head into their hearts. So if we can write stories that can reach into people's hearts, that's what we should be doing. 
You know, you're you're right on. And I was one of those guys who thought that the future would be this um, squeaky clean um, paradise of rational thought, where all of the 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 uh, superstition of religion would be pushed aside. And uh, that again is one of the found foundational pillars on which your Starship Gilead uh, trilogy rests. But it's not that way. And you also, I think, address that with the plot here with the uh, the cult that uh, is willing to sacrifice an entire planet in order to bring their god back to life. Because reality is that uh, when you push Christ out of the public square, if you push Christ out of the human heart, it will be filled by devotion to other gods. It will not be a uh, a neo-atheist paradise, contrary to what uh, Richard Dawkins would like to believe. Um just to, on Johnny Cash for a second, because I'm right there with you. My dad, my mom, huge Johnny Cash fans. When dad passed, I've got, I don't know if you can see it in the, you, you probably can't see it in the camera here, but I've got a, dad's record collection or a portion of it behind me here in the, <laughs> I've got a, a USB uh, turntable that I need to finally get around to start digitizing some of these songs, but a lot of Johnny Cash in this collection here. Um, how much of Johnny Cash is in the bard character that you include in Starship Gilead? Uh Oh, a wee little bit. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, he's a huge influence on that character. Um, I noticed they started out and, with uh, uh, with a virtual band behind him uh, singing The Highwayman. One, yes. one of his performances. Yeah, The Highwayman yeah. and uh, Luther Perkins is in the band. Luther Perkins, so, yeah, yes. quite a few uh, references to Johnny. <laughs> yeah. Luther played um, the boogie woogie. Yeah. yeah, quite a bit. <laughs> he he's one of the more intriguing characters, yep. but I don't want to give anything away there. Um, so writing a world, creating a world in which humanity has gone out to the stars, which, uh, obviously requires some thought. I mean, there are some Christians who say, well, no, no, we were created stri- strictly for the earth. And so we're, that's not never going to happen. All right. You got to get past that. Then you got a world where what, uh, what faith there was has been erased by this global government that says, no, no, religion is the cause of all society's ills. So we're going to eliminate all of that too. Um, how hard was it for you as a Christian to imagine a world like that? Well, I didn't think it was hard at all because <laughs> um, that's the world we're heading into. It was, you know, you, you take where we are now and you fast forward to Star Trek time and what does it look like? Well, I don't think it looks like Starfleet Academy at San Francisco. I think it looks like Starship Gilead. I think you have this dystopian future where you know people are put into, uh, you know, DS9 had an episode where they stuck the homeless people into sanctuary districts. Well, I stuck all the religious people on another planet, a sanctuary planet, and they just let them go, and you're done. And uh, now, you know, what's left? Well, you have people that are interested in themselves, people that are interested in advancing their their belief system. And, you know, immediately once all the other religions are gone, what happens? Another religion just comes right in and, um, you know, fills in the void. But, the you know, the thing that they're bringing, the, the truth that they're preaching is a very dark, bad truth. And, you know... I'm not giving too much away here when I say that the 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 belief of this religion is is that um, they're they think it's an ancient alien, but it's a god. It's a watcher. It's in you know, a Bene Elohim. It's you know one of the watchers that was uh, either from the pre-flood era or from the um, the Babel era, and um, you know they they bring him out of um, Sheol or Tartarus. I can't remember which one, <laughs> and. Um, you know they they bring him out and they they prop him up as their as their emperor and things go downhill real fast so that's it's, what happens <laughs> it's it's a a an interesting conundrum because you're dealing then with uh those who who see that this character is evil but they don't believe that he's supernatural and uh so they're trying to use weapons in the natural realm to defeat this this enemy that that creates some interesting uh, right. conflict. Uh, how, how long in over the course of this trilogy will it take for the good guys, uh, the the Manthus family, who uh, father and and you know two children, uh, who uh, and you might explain this how how the captainship of this uh, the starship, the, this class of starship to which Gilead belongs, how they had sort of become a uh, 
a, a fiefdom or a dukedom of their own in in a in a, in a space in, in, in outer space. Uh, how how long will it take them to figure out that the uh, the weapons they have will not prevail against this particular enemy? Oh, about three, about two and a half books. <laughs> 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 they have uh, quite a quite a bit of uh, of struggle and. Um, banging their head against the wall, going in the wrong direction before they, uh, they can finally sort out. And, um, you know, the answers are not in, um, you know, in more advanced weapons, the advanced answers are in the supernatural realm that mm-hmm. they're fighting against. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a struggle. <laughs> I, I like the way you set up the, uh, human civilization in the future where these starships and, and again we'll talk about this the the class of starship to which gilead belongs and there were only a couple of them left from the original uh fleet of uh, starships that had existed uh, hundreds of years earlier but they essentially become the the castle if you will for the lord who then is the protector and right. overseer of a sector of space so um, unlike during the Middle Ages where you'd have a, a, a duke or an earl or a, a lord who would have his castle and then the surrounding fields and lands belong to him and they tithe to him and he would protect them. Uh, now you've got the same thing except it's planets and a spaceship. I thought that was, I thought that was really inventive. Uh, but how many other ships are there like the Gilead and what happened to them? Um, well, most of them are, are wiped out in a, in a battle that is you know, in the deep past of, um, of where this story is, there's a couple of them that are still out there. Um, but most of them are gone because of this battle. And, um, so this story is all set, you know, in, in a time of, you know, a couple hundred years after that battle. Um, and maybe it's something I could explore of how they get there. Um, I think that would be a fun exploration. Um, but uh, at this point, um, you know, there's just, this trilogy is set far enough in the future that that's some sort of, distant thing that happened a long time ago um but basically the the you know the the first captain of gilead uh the first mantis he um he's running his ship and they they leave you know what it you know is sort of a parallel of the federation um it's in ruins and they go off on their own and they just try to build something new and then of course over time even he trying to be a good man still becomes a king rather than a president. Um, there's no election. He, you know, he uh, assumes the throne and he wants to give it to his son rather than to the next, um, you know, most viable uh, person. And of course, over time um, with Kings, what happens is betrayals and, you know, people locked away in towers and assassins. And, um, you know, there's some, like I said, there's some game of Thrones kind of um, betrayals and, uh, rising up and trying to claim the throne of of Gilead, um, which doesn't always work out so well. No, no, uh, I, I did like the the little, little touch there where the captain's chair, which uh, on Star Trek looks very comfy, is this really uncomfortable throne that the captain has to sit in, and uh, it's kind of a a mixed blessing. I mean, okay, I run the ship, but boy, this chair makes my back hurt. Um, the <laughs> um, the, the character, again, without giving anything away, I, I got to say that the character of the Bard, John Galen, was was really intriguing. And um, you didn't give anything away in the first book what, uh, w- without revealing anything that's going to be uh, explained in a future uh, novel. What, Other than Johnny Cash, uh, what inspired his character and what role do you foresee for him? And again, I'm asking you to walk a line between sharing some more without revealing any of the uh, spoilers. Okay, um, so this this character is a um, as a as a bard, a traveling musician, um, and he's been traveling the stars for a long time, not for a lot longer than one lifetime. In fact, right. he, you know, almost ancient. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I uh, I am exploring a lot of um, different mythology. And, um, you know, as, as much as I've explored the, um, the watcher Enoch thing, um, there is another piece of, um, Christian mythology that dates back to the crusade period. And, um, anyway, 
that's uh, that's another piece that I've explored with this character, and ah. his story will be revealed quite a bit more in book two. And um, I've tried to take uh, uh, this piece of mythology and turn it on its ear a little bit. Um, so it's hard to say with that. It'll give the whole thing away if I say it. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, that. It's really intriguing, and uh, it, because it was pretty clear that that there was something unusual about that uh, character who finds himself in the middle of a situation, um, thinking he was just hopping a ride on the starship to some other planet, and uh, of course things get hot, and now he's in the middle of it, uh, but appears to be the only one who really has a grasp or the beginning of an inkling of what is uh, actually going on. Um, right. When when you take a character like that. I know Sharon and the way she works a little bit, she will often add things as she's, as she's going and she's not even sure where it's going to lead, just sort of drops these little seeds. And then uh, later on, it's like, Oh, okay. I can pick that up and work that in over here. That'll be really, do you do that sort of thing? Or do you sort of plot out the, the, okay, this character is going to be this. And I was going to do this, that, and the other, and have his whole arc, his story arc plotted out before you begin. Um, not really. Uh, I used to plot really heavily and I would not finish anything because all I would do was outline. Um, now I, I just sort of write a, a loose outline of, mm-hmm. of where I want to go with the characters. And, you know, sometimes I'll find there's an interesting direction that I wasn't anticipating and I can, I'm free to explore it, um, without having to scratch, you know, two years worth of outlining or something. So, um, <laughs> you know, my outlines right. are maybe two pages long for this whole book. <laughs> yeah. I, I started uh, working on a follow-up to my uh, novel, the God conspiracy. And this is the first one where I just had a rough idea and I'm starting to write it in it as though I'm seeing the movie in my head, which is kind of the way Sharon writes. And I'm finding that it's, it's already right. going in surprising directions. How often do your characters surprise you and do things you didn't expect? Um, a lot, <laughs> uh, quite a lot. Um, you know, you get in and you you hear their voice, and once you start to do that, um, not in a creepy way, but you know, once you start to do that, you you know, you think, well, doggone it, I don't think this character would do that. Um, you know, I think that they would respond to this situation like this, and um, you know, I think that it also gives you a chance sometimes to not make a cookie cutter, um, you know, where this guy is always good and this guy is always evil. You know, sometimes characters are motivated by things and you you see in real life that somebody is, you know, really good, but they made this one mistake there. You, you know, Johnny Cash is tempted by drugs, but he's otherwise is really good. But there's this one area in his life that he's, you know, he has a failing or like Ted Bundy, who worked as a, on a suicide hotline. And, you know, here's like the worst person you can imagine. But there's somebody out there that got talked off a bridge by Ted Bundy. Wow. You know, so, um, you know, you can, uh, you can find, um, that people's motivations are not as black and white a lot of the time. And, um, uh, by not, you know, by pantsing the story, uh, you get a chance to explore some of those things and, you know, maybe make it, uh, a little bit more, um, unpredictable. How, um, did your publisher react when you were kind of laying this out and, uh, it became clear that you're, you're kind of embedding, uh, a Christian message into a, uh, a space opera. Um, well, it's funny because um, how do I say this? <laughs> <laughs> they uh, there was some talk about um, you know making changes. What kind of change? This actually had another publisher at one point, and um, they uh, they wanted to scrap almost all of that and it like to me if you took that stuff out and you just gutted this story and you just made it a story about you know space marines fighting each other i don't care about that it doesn't interest me at all and um you know to me why am i doing this if i'm not writing something that can make you think inspire you and so um i actually ended up leaving my first publisher and the reason I went to the second publisher is they gave me the freedom to just do what I wanted. And, um, you know, they said, you, you, you know, we know who you are. We know what you've done. We be- you know, we've read your other books. We believe in you. And, you know, we'll take over the cover 
we'll you know we'll do the marketing you just you know you just take the story and do what you want and you know give give the cover your your green light and we'll take it from there and so to me that was like too good of an opportunity to pass on. and i love these guys like i i feel like i was in a in a dark place um and i didn't know how to get out and and they saved me from um you know a, a hard situation and and honestly, when when the whole Amazon thing came down, you know, one of these guys was, you know, Steve was talking me, you know, he was the one talking me off the bridge uh, <laughs> when I didn't know what to, you know, what to do. And like, I, I was walking around my farm, and um, you know, he he was like, "It's gonna be okay, you know, you're gonna be fine here. You just gotta, you know, get it back up on that horse, and you know, let's come up with a pen name." And we did. And, um, you know, so they, I feel like these are, um, these are some good friends and they've, uh, they've really helped me to, um, you know, to bring my vision to life. So, you know, that, that's what a great publisher does is, um, I mean, you know, <laughs> um, they're not afraid of exploring ideas. When we read books, books are about ideas and there's some powerful ideas in the world. And, um, you know, let's just talk about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not afraid to talk about something that I disagree with. Let's talk about it. And, um, you know, so that's, uh, that's what I hope. Um, I hope people get from that. And uh, yeah, I, I love this publisher. I'm very, I'm very happy with them. And they gave me a lot of freedom. So they're not marketing it strictly at a, a Christian audience. Um, it is uh, clear the cover art is just absolutely fantastic. And I'll put that up on the screen here uh, so that people can see what I'm talking about. This is uh, really well done. Branding is great. Um, not that as Christians, we should be overly concerned about, you know, branding, but you know, we live in the real world. And if you don't attract people's eye or attention with uh, something, your, your message is never going to get across. Um, at the end of this series, where, whether, whether it's three books, six books, however many books are in this, what do you hope, uh, say a non-believer reading this, what do you hope they think they take, uh, take away from the Starship Gilead series? Well, what I, what I hope is the same thing that happened to me. I hope somebody reads this book and goes, man, that was nuts. Well, well what do I do now? I, I'm, I'm still thinking about it. He had all that stuff about Enoch in there. Maybe I'll read that, you know, maybe I'll, you know, I'll go back and read those Bible stories again and, apply this other weird worldview to it. Oh, maybe I'll read Michael Heiser. Maybe I'll listen to, you know, a uh, view from the bunker. Maybe I'll watch <laughs> Skywatch TV. And then, you know, we don't, we don't have any, any control over whether someone gets saved or not. Right. God does all that work. All we can do is just plant ideas in their head. And I'm, I'm trying to plant ideas in people's head here, trying to give them other ways to, to look at these stories. And if they walk away from this this series and they read the Bible for its literary value, I feel like, you know, I've I've put a thread of an idea, a gem germ of an idea into their mind. And God will do the rest if he wants to. And um he'll he'll work on them in his own way. But there there's a huge group of people out there, you know, the Star Trek fans, the Star Wars fans, the Galactica fans, the Warhammer 40k fans, everything else that like they like I said they're searching for meaning and they're finding it in these stories. So why don't we tell them stories where they can find a deeper meaning and you know the the structure the story is built on instead of being, you know, infinite diversity and infinite combination. The story is, the structure is, you know, the Bible, the book of Enoch, the unseen realm. Let's go there. Let's, you know, let's fight for what we believe in, in our own way. You know, some people are called to go to Angola and be a missionary to the people there in that country. Other people are not called to do that. They're called to do something else, to be a podcaster to be a farmer, a writer, you know, to, to, to be a missionary to the people around you in the situation that you're in. This is a, a, a lost people group yeah. is science fiction and fantasy fans. No one is ministering to them. Brian Godawa is yes. You and Sharon are Michael Heiser is, but not many people are trying to do this. Mm -hmm. And if, if we can't take 
our ideas and put them into stories that they would want to read, then you know we're 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 doing what God asked us to do, told us to do, commanded us to do, and we're doing it for another group of people that that really is underserviced. Amen. Starship Gilead. The website is starshipgilead.com. Uh, Kevin slash John, wh- where's the best place for people to uh, to buy the books? Uh, well, um, oddly enough, this uh, publisher <laughs> only sells them through Amazon. So <laughs> I still don't have multiple accounts. I don't have an account at all. Um, but um, you can only get them on Amazon or Audible. Um <laughs> Well, Buy it through uh, Apple Books. <laughs> well, absolutely. Uh, we will put links in the show notes, and you'll find it. And again, a link to uh, the website, starshipgilead.com. Uh, Kevin, writing under the, John, the pen name John Graves, author of the Starship Gilead trilogy, the first book, Relics of Utopia, book two, Prodigal, book three, The Last Battlefield. Those will be out uh, shortly, I understand. Prodigal coming out uh, April 5th? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Okay, well, it's on the uh, website, and uh, you can you can pre-order. I've seen at Amazon, so I will be doing that. Uh, Kevin, thanks very much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Derek. Again, Kevin G. Summers writing under the pen name John Graves due to circumstances beyond his control. StarshipGilead.com, the website for the trilogy. Check it out. If you're a fan of science fiction like me, you will really enjoy it. And I've noticed that he does exactly what Sharon does at the end of every Red Wing Saga novel. Cliffhanger! So, uh, yes, eagerly waiting for April 5th and uh, book two of the Starship Gilead trilogy to uh, come out. Coming up, we're going to talk, uh, well, next weekend, we're going to be in Dallas, save 20 bucks on uh, conference registration for the Eyes to See conference. We'll talk about the Russo-Ukrainian War and um, ministry that we became, we became aware of over the last couple of days, doing some good work with refugees there, how you can be of assistance. And uh, again, we'll just touch on this. I don't want to beat this into the ground or make this into a running feud between uh, ministries, but uh, just touch again on why Russia is not in Ezekiel 38 and 39, the war of Gog and Magog. Russia's part of it, sure, but uh, Russia is not the main enemy involved. There is a lot of stuff to get through before we get to that uh, that battle. That and more as a view from the bunker continues straight ahead. Question. How do you fight something you cannot see? Davian is a third level master of the order. A small group of men who alone have the power to battle the most fearsome creatures in all of Saramond. For thousands of years, the brothers of the order have protected their world. Now, something has upset the delicate balance of power between man and dragon and Davian must face what appears to be a dragon that cannot be seen. But Davian is losing his grip on reality, and the fate of the world rests with a stable hand, an underfed priest, and a gardener who's fallen from the stars. Iron Dragons, Book One of the Saramond Quest by Derek P. Gilbert. New from Rose Avenue Fiction. Talking the Walk every Sunday night from the beautiful Missouri Ozarks. This is A View from the Bunker. You'll find us online at vftb.net. If you're watching this on YouTube, and thank you because our YouTube channel has kind of blown up here over the last few weeks. Uh, really appreciate you new subscribers. If you have not yet subscribed, uh, click the little uh, thing in the right-hand corner. Josh Peck and those kids, they know how to do all this stuff. Uh, thank you for subscribing. I truly appreciate it. YouTube.com slash Derek Gilbert. Share this with your friends and follow us on social media. Twitter at ViewFromBunker or at Derek Gilbert. And we're diversifying so that we don't get uh, canceled all at once. Uh, View from the Bunker on Facebook, but Gab, me, we get her parlor, Derek P. 
Gilbert, at Derek P. Gilbert on those new social media sites. Uh, the Russo-Ukrainian war, is it going the way Vladimir Putin thought? It uh, appears not. It appears not, but uh, I am aware that all of the news sources I have are filtered through one perspective or another, and trying to triangulate on the truth is a real challenge today. On the one hand, you've got the side that says that uh, Vladimir Putin is an evil monster and everything Russia does is bad. I was, you know, I'm old enough to have been raised at a time when uh, the Soviet Union was still around, and so Russia was the great enemy of truth, justice in the American way, and uh, being an officially atheistic country, the Soviet Union was, of course, an enemy of God as well. And so it was our Christian duty to uh, hate the Reds, hate the Russians. Isn't it interesting that the media here in the United States over the last uh, couple of decades has uh, rebranded the color red? So now red means Republican because the Democrats are the communists, but they've changed the colors on us. It's so it's still cognitive dissonance for me. Um, just a sign, I guess, that I am uh, that I'm old. But there are other reports coming out that uh, perhaps Russia is not as um, stymied as Western media would have us believe, and that this has just all been a very deliberate approach to avoid destroying as much infrastructure as uh, to to try to de- destroy as few, a little infrastructure as possible. Maybe n- not for humanitarian reasons, but just because they don't want to have to rebuild it. That is uh, the Kremlin. So, where will all of this lead? I don't know, but what I do know is that people are dying people are um it, it, some of the heartbreaking uh, s- scenes that you see on uh, on video certainly being used for propaganda value but it uh, doesn't make them any less real i mean here sitting in our little protected bubble of the missouri ozarks it's easy to set back and say well this really isn't our fight it's you know and i'm one of these guys who's been saying this this is not our fight we are not uh, you know, Ukraine is not in our sphere of influence, et cetera, et cetera. But when you see this dream of refugees leaving Russia for Romania and Poland and Moldova and, uh, you know, what, what are we as Christians supposed to do? Well, well, we'll let the politicians sort all of this out. But the fact is there are people who need food, clothing and shelter right now. Right now. So that is something that we as Christians can do, and uh, I'm slow in catching on to this, but the um, last couple of days, Sharon and I were at Morningside, which is Jim Baker's place, as we were on a panel with uh, David Hevener talking about his new book. And uh, during the conversations, we uh, learned that they are supporting a ministry that has been working with with orphans in, in Moldova uh, called The Orphan's Hands. Now, this is uh, Philip Cameron. Is uh, He's a Scottish fellow. He's a friend of Jim and Lori Baker. Uh, he's on their program fairly regularly. But um, th- what they're doing in, in Moldova is extremely timely. They've been working on a, a community to rescue orphans in Moldova and Ukraine because those two countries are prime sources of children and young women who are trafficked throughout the world, not just Eastern Europe, but around the world. Sexual trafficking, human trafficking is still a very real thing, and it's what we do at Skywatch TV. We support the work at Whispering Ponies Ranch, which, um, through our partner ministry, Royal Family Kids, works with children in the foster system, because here in the United States, trafficking is still a real thing. It's just worse in places where the standard of living is not quite what it is here. Orphans in Eastern Europe are often property. They become property. And the orphan's hands, Philip Cameron and his ministry have been working on a site just uh, north of the capital city in Moldova for orphans, but they are rapidly converting it into a refugee center. And uh, the team at uh, Morningside, Jim Baker and his ministry have been sending as much money as they can scrape together over to uh, Philip Cameron. So if you're interested in helping, you can find the website, theorphanshands.org. It's all one word, the orphans hands, all lowercase, theorphanshands.org. And uh, there is a, a button to to donate. Um we we've not met Philip Cameron, but we've met the team at Morningside and we've come to know them over the last seven years and trust them. So uh, this is a ministry that they're supporting. Uh, this would be one option for you. You can, of course, uh, research others out there for uh, help, but that is the one thing we as Christians can do. Um, 
and it, it's it's needed. I mean, there are a lot of opinions right now as to whether this could have been avoided or not. It's interesting that Bill Maher, as I mentioned in the intro to the show, that uh, he is asking the uncomfortable question, uncomfortable for uh, progressives, that is, that, uh, you know, why is it that uh, Vladimir Putin didn't invade during the four years of Donald Trump's presidency when Trump was supposed to be uh, Putin's puppet? Why is that? I think there's a fundamental difference between the way Donald Trump approaches things and the way Joe Biden and progressives in general approach things. If he is to be believed, Donald Trump had a conversation with Vlad Putin and said to Putin, if you go into Ukraine, we'll hit Moscow. And according to the way the story is told, Putin said, oh, that's ridiculous. He apparently didn't believe Trump and Trump just continued on said, hey, you know, it would be a shame. See all those domes, those beautiful domes in Moscow going up in flames. Now, of course, it would mean a nuclear exchange. And um, I don't know whether Putin believed that Trump would actually do it or not, but it might be that uh, Trump made Putin and his team question, is he just crazy enough to do it? Because if the nukes started flying, you know, this is what they called back in the day, mutual assured destruction or mad, because it would be mad for anybody to start flinging nukes around. But Trump apparently seems to have conveyed this idea to Russian leadership that uh, if you do this, we will hang the consequences, and we will take out your capital city, the city that you're so proud of. And uh, four years. You know, 2014, they took Crimea, annexed the Crimea, and uh, now here we are in 2022, eight years later, um, rolling into uh, rolling into Ukraine. So Trump talked really tough, but he's willing to sit down with Putin. Okay, you want something, I want something, let's, let's sit, let's talk, maybe we can work out a deal here, let's cut a deal. The the opposite approach is the one favored by progressives like Obama and Biden, where they talk a real tough game. Um, where you know they said, uh, "Hey, look, we're we're uh, you know Putin is a thug and and he's a he's a he's a dictator and uh, you know we just you know is basically saying these things." Where Trump was you know saying nice things, say, "Yeah, hey, I got along with him. Okay, I understand him." We get we get, which gave progressives political ammunition to use against Trump. Privately, Trump is saying, hey, look, if you do this, I'll do this crazy thing and destroy your city. Flip side, Biden, Obama, calling Putin a thug and uh, insulting him and refusing to back down. You know, Putin's saying, hey, we'll just guarantee Ukraine won't be in NATO. That's a non-starter. We're not even going to talk about that. But then Putin sends in the tanks and now it's like, oh, well, um, we'll we'll send some stinger missiles and uh okay yeah poland delivered those mig 29s to our air base in germany but we're not going to send those into and understand i'm not saying that we should because i i do understand that uh, there's a point at which we might as well just openly declare war and and frankly i don't know i mean is if we don't fight now are we going to have to fight in the future for poland or estonia maybe maybe Will Putin start throwing tactical nukes around on the battlefield? Maybe. People I respect think he will, like Lieutenant Colonel Robert McGinnis. All I know is that there are elderly people, women, children, people at risk who are suffering right now, and at least we can address that and share the love of Jesus Christ and then pray. Because uh, the, the politicians have walked us into this um, eyes wide shut. I, I'm just curious as to why it seems the fallen realm, the principalities and powers, cosmic rulers over this present darkness behind the scenes, why they seem bound and determined to get us into a war with Russia. Because th- this seems to have been a goal for quite some time. Provoke the bear into a conflict. It, it makes no rational sense and yet that appears to be the direction that they've wanted us to go for quite some time. Well, again, I'll say just pray that uh, cooler heads prevail and that we can get out of this without things getting worse. At this point, though, it seems that both Russia and Ukraine have lost so many men that there is no peace with honor at this point. It's, it's going to require one side or the other just being destroyed, and uh, only God knows where that leads. So, um, as you know... A, I put up a program a couple of weeks ago where I just uh, talked about uh, Gog and Magog because every time Russia gets involved in 
any kind of a military uh, situation, people start pointing to Russia and saying, ah, Ezekiel 38, the Gog Magog war is about to happen. Well, uh, you know, again, I didn't want this to become like a, a long running uh, controversy. There, there was a uh, rather respected and rightly so uh, prophecy teacher who um, spotted one of my tweets about this and, um, and did, a, did a program on it explaining why I was wrong. Um, not going to name him because, again, this is not a personality thing. He seems like a really nice guy. Uh, people I know and like know and like him, so it's, it's not about that. Just going to explain again why I don't think we should read uh, end times eschatology necessarily into this. Although there are some things that are happening that are really interesting. Uh, it was reported today, Saturday, as I'm recording this, uh, March 12th, that uh, President Zelensky of Ukraine has suggested that peace talks with Vladimir Putin take place in Jerusalem with Prime Minister Naftali Benevit, uh, Bennett serving as the intermediary. So suddenly that becomes a really like, oh, okay, um, how do we parse that? Uh, I, I could wind up eating my words. But again, at this point, this is where I come down on this, because I believe that uh, the Gog-Magog conflict, as we laid out in Last Clash of the Titans, um, Sharon and I wrote about this in um, Giants, Gods, and Dragons. I may have written, on, I, I'm getting to the point now, and maybe just the age, you know, the memory holes, uh, where uh, I'm forgetting what's in what book. I know it's in Last Clash of the Titans, that this war ends with the Battle of Armageddon, which means since Armageddon concludes the day of the Lord that, you know, we, and the Great Tribulation period, where there's at least seven years before things really uh, blow up. But anyway, the argument that, that Rosh in uh, the, the Hebrew word, and it's not Rosh, I had to look it up and uh, hear it pronounced by an actual Hebrew speaker. It's, R- excuse me, I can't roll the R's. Rosh, Rosh is the, uh, the word translated chief or head in uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Okay, in Ezekiel 38, verse 2, Gog of Magog is described as the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Now, there are some translations, including the NASB, that render it differently. They uh, translate the word chief, as, or the word r- rosh, I'm not getting that, that, that tongue roll, uh, rosh, as um, Russia. They, they, they interpret that to be a, a, top, a toponym which is a place name. Um, when you do a word search using Bible software, you'll see that that uh, Hebrew word rosh appears 476 times in the Bible. 476 appearances of the word rosh, and it uh, is not a toponym or place name or proper noun in any of the other 475 appearances. So, it would seem, and now that doesn't mean by in and of itself that that's not what the word means in Ezekiel 38 and 39, but it, it does suggest that perhaps we're reading into the word a meaning that we want to see there rather than taking the word and, and saying, okay, the context of every one of the other 475 appearances or 472 or whatever is maybe suggests that the actual meaning is correct. Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, rather than prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, as you see in the NASB. The first ones really to define Rosh as a, as a proper noun were uh, Wilhelm Gesenius and C.F. Kyle, who were renowned scholars of Hebrew back in the 19th century. Uh, Gesenius died 1842. Kyle died 1888. Uh, Gesenius wrote, and I'll quote, Rosh was a designation for the tribes north of the Taurus Mountains, dwelling in the neighborhood of the Volga River. Also that Rosh in Ezekiel 38-39 is a northern nation mentioned with Meshach and Tubal. Undoubtedly the Russians, who are mentioned by the Byzantine, note this, by the Byzantine writers of the 10th century under the name of Rosh, dwelling north of the Taurus, the Taurus Mountains in Turkey, as dwelling on the river Ra, which is the Volga. Now, uh, Gesenius is right about that, but bear in mind that, uh, again, the, the Byzantine or Eastern Roman Empire, which collapsed in 1453, didn't note the Russians in the region until the 9th century, which is correct. That's when the Varangians, 
who were Vikings, moved down from Scandinavia and settled in the region around Kiev. Until that time, there really is not a uh, any group of people or a place that would have been familiar under the name Ras, Rosh, or Russia prior to the emergence of the Kievan Rus at the end of the 9th century. And they really came to prominence in the 10th century, around the year 988, when their leader, ironically named Vladimir, married the daughter of the Eastern Roman emperor because he needed mercenaries to help fight off some rebellious generals. That's really when Russia came to be known. And that's who Gesenius is turning to as the source for people who are supposed to have lived 1,500 years earlier during the time of Ezekiel. Um, Kyle, likewise, uh, in the uh, middle of the 19th century, was uh, one of the first to translate this as a proper name. But it should be noted that while Kyle is undoubtedly one of the uh, top Hebrew scholars of the last 200 years, we've learned a thing or two about uh, biblical Hebrew since Kyle's commentary, Kyle and Delitch, published in 1861. That's 160 years ago. We've learned a few things about biblical Hebrew since then. The discovery of uh, other tablets with Semitic languages like the Moabite stone and the texts from uh, Ugarit, among others, have helped us develop a better understanding of uh, biblical Hebrew. So while Gesenius and Kyle 160 years ago, did an excellent job with their uh, uh, lexicon and their commentaries on the Bible. Um, they aren't the final answer. They are not the, the ultimate authorities here. Again, looking back to the Old Testament, how is the word Rosh used elsewhere? One, one example in the book of Ezekiel out of the 476 is supposed to you know, we're, we're supposed to ignore the other occurrences where the word always means head or head in the sense of the chief or top man. And that's, that is what is in view here. Uh, again, I'll refer back to Daniel I. Block, whose uh, commentary on the book of Ezekiel is, uh, is considered authoritative. And uh, he said, uh, who then is this Rosh? The popular identification of Rosh with Russia is impossibly anachronistic and based on a faulty etymology. The assonantal similarities, meaning it the fact that they sound alike, between Russia and Rosh being purely accidental. In the 19th century, some scholars associated Rosh with Rus, a Scythian tribe inhabiting the northern Taurus Mountains, according to Byzantine and Arabic writings. But again, the Byzantines lived 15, 1600 years after Ezekiel, so recent attempts to equate Rosh with Rashu or Reshu or Arashi in Neo-Assyrian annals, this would be about the time of Ezekiel, are more credible, except that the place so named was located far to the east on the border between Babylon and Elam. Would have nothing to do with Meshach and Tubal. Meshach and Tubal located in eastern Asia Minor, eastern Turkey. Elam is where Iran is now. So again, it's not in the right place. Um... If Rosh is to be read as the first in a series of names, the conjunction should precede Meshach. Rosh is therefore best understood as a common noun appositional to and offering a closer definition of Nashi, which is prince. So, when you look at all of the, uh, the other place names in Ezekiel 38 and 39, Meshach, Tubal, uh, of the northern coalition that is, Gomer, Beth Togarma, and put Magog in that context, and then go back and look at uh, where Magog falls in Genesis chapter 10 in the Table of Nations. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Medai, Yavan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tiras. Gomer, the Sumerians, who came down in the 7th century from the steppes north of the Black Sea, but then settled in the middle of of Anatolia. They destroyed uh, the, the kingdom of Phrygia, which was ruled by King Mita, Midas, the guy with the golden touch. He was a, he was a real guy. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Medai, the Medes, who lived uh, near the Caspian Sea. Uh, Yavan, that would be the Greeks, so the people who lived in the Greek islands off the west coast of what is now Turkey. Uh, Tubal and Meshek, again, occupying eastern and east-central Anatolia and Tiras, probably the uh, Tyrrhenians, or another name for the Etruscans. 
uh, descendants of the people of Troy, again, Western Anatolia. So when you take all of these names geographically in context, what you've got are people who occupy, for the most part, the world between the Aegean Sea on the west and the Caspian Sea on the east, but all of them south of the Black Sea. And if you look at a map, you'll see that Russia is north of the Black Sea. So context there also suggests that Magog, Gog of Magog, not connected to Russia. And, and finally, and this is the, the key, uh, the phrase uttermost parts of the north, which is used three times in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Beth Togarma, from the uttermost parts of the north. Oh, Togarma, by the way, another uh, uh, nation well known to be in eastern Anatolia, uh, connected to the later Armenians, according to their histories. Uh, the uttermost parts of the north, in Hebrew, that phrase is Yarkate Tsephon, Yarkate Tsephon, and that only appears three times in the Bible. Here in Ezekiel 38 and 39, and again, I understand why this can lead one to conclude that Russia is in view here, because when you draw a line on a map north from Jerusalem, Russia is as uttermost north as you're going to get. But that's not what the phrase means in Hebrew. It's not what it meant. In, it's not what it would have meant in the minds of Ezekiel's readers in the sixth century BC. Yarkate Tsephon. Here in Ezekiel, it's also in Psalm 48. Let me bring that up really quickly, which was a comparison between God's Mount of Assembly and. Uh, Another mountain, Psalm 48 reads, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. All right, now two things. First, uh, beautiful in elevation. Mount Zion, the temple mount in Jerusalem, is not even the tallest hill in Jerusalem. Okay, the Mount of Olives is 200 feet taller. The Western Hill is taller. Mount Scopus is taller. There are plenty of hills in and around Jerusalem that are taller than Mount Zion. So he's not talking about the height of the mountain here. He's talking about its importance. That's what the psalmist has got in mind here. Then you read Mount Zion in the far north. And that phrase in the far north is Yarkate Tsephon. Even 3,000 years ago, in the time of King David, they knew that Mount Zion was not in the far north. They knew that they had Syrian neighbors and Canaanite neighbors, and beyond them they had the Hittites and then some other savage people that uh, they didn't even want to think about living way in the north. Zion was not there. So what what is that phrase? That phrase in Hebrew is Har Tzion Yarkate Tzaphon. It's a little bit of wordplay, but it's a comparison. Mount Zion, God's holy mountain, with this other place called Yarkate Tzaphon. The other place where you find this in Scripture is the key to understanding this. It's Isaiah 14. That's the famous chapter that in the King James reads, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? In the ESV, How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said into your heart, in your heart, I will ascend to heaven Above the stars of God, I will set my throne on... These are the five I wills. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly. That's an important phrase too. That's uh, har moed. In the far reaches of the north, or in the heights of the north, the sides of the north. Yarkate tzephon. But you are brought down to Sheol to the far reaches of the pit. Mount tzephon. It is what is in view here. This is the mount of assembly of the divine rebel... From Eden, and I argue in my, my new book, uh, Second Coming of Saturn, that this is not Satan, this is actually Shemiyaza, who led the rebellion of Genesis 6 rather than the Nakash from Genesis 3. But that's another argument. <laughs> anyway, the point is this rebel wants to establish his Har Moed, Mount of Assembly or Mount of the Congregation, on Mount Tzaphon in the north. And we know where this mountain is. This was a critically important mountain in the ancient world. It was not just the uh, the mountain where Baal's palace was located, which is pretty huge, considering that Israel was surrounded by Canaanites who uh, worshipped Baal as the king of their pantheon. It was also the mountain sacred to the storm god of the Hurrians and the Hittites. Their, their version of Baal, called uh, Tarhunta by the Hittites and, and Tesha by the Hurrians, and even Zeus, the uh, Greek version of Baal had a connection to Mount Zaphon. It's where he destroyed the chaos monster Typhon, whose name derives from Mount Zaphon. 
This mountain was so important in the Hebrew mind that Zaphon became the word for the compass point north. And that's not the word in other Semitic languages. It's uh, Simal, which means left. Because when you're facing the rising sun in the east, Simal, left, oh, that's north. Yamin, that's right. That's why uh, you get the political party in uh, Israel, the Binu, or the uh, uh, Yamina party, which is the right-wing party. Benjamin, bin, bin Yamin, son of the right hand. Southerner is what it means. That's what's in view here. It's a, it's a, it's a battle. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a conflict over whose mount of assembly, whose har moed will reign supreme in the cosmos. This rebel, this rebel or, or God whose mount of assembly is Zion. Is it Zion or Zaphon? That will reign, that will be the place where the Elohim assemble. Of course, it'll be Zion. But that's what this is all about. And that's why, by the way, when John writes in Revelation 19, the place of the final battle is Armageddon. It's because it's, the, it, it's for the, it, the Har Moed. A scholar by the name of Charles Torrey, back uh, almost 90 years ago now, wrote this paper where he explained that this phrase in Isaiah 14 helps us to understand Revelation 19. So when you translate from Hebrew into Greek, the Moed is, uh, uh, there's a character in the middle of it. It's a glottal stop. Moed, that glottal stop is an ayin. There's no corresponding character in Greek or in English. And so that uh, ayin uh, in Greek, John uh, transliterated it into Greek by using the uh, Greek character gamma. And so English speakers transliterating from Greek into English and then trying to figure out the original Hebrew assumed that John must have meant a gimel, which is the g sound in Armageddon instead of harmoed, mount of assembly. We've been teaching people for generations now that uh, the final battle of the age will be fought 50 miles away from Jerusalem at Megiddo. Even though Zechariah 12, Zechariah 14, Joel 3 all put that final battle right there at uh, Jerusalem. Which makes sense, because that's where God's mount of assembly is. And uh, again, there's details in Last Clash of the Titans as to why Gog, Magog, and Armageddon are the same battle. Uh, when you look further down Ezekiel 39 and see the, uh, the gruesome feast that uh, the birds of the air and the beasts of the field are called to, it's, uh, it's essentially echoed by John in Revelation 19. It's the same sacrificial feast at the end of that final battle. Um, in Ezekiel 39, God says, uh, the nations will know that I am Yahweh, the Holy One in Israel, because he's on the battlefield. Every other time you see a similar phrase in the Old Testament, it's the Holy One of Israel. Ezekiel 39, Holy One in Israel. It ends at Armageddon, which means, regardless of what's happening between Russia and Ukraine today, at the very least... There's seven years to go before everything, God resets everything, the greater reset. But uh, I think it will probably be a little longer than that because there's some other stuff that we need to get through prophetically, I think. But God didn't make all of his plans crystal clear to us in this time-space domain because too many of us still have conversations with the enemy, sometimes unknowingly. So uh, God will reveal the plan when it's time and... Uh, We'll look back on it then and, and see how wrong we all were about all of this. Uh, some conferences to tell you about very quickly. The Hear the Watchman Eyes to See conference. Next weekend, we will be in Dallas. We'll be flying out on Thursday, coming back on the 21st. But uh, if you're in the area, please consider coming to see us because we'll be there with uh, L.A. Marzulli, Pastor Paul Begley, who we just saw at uh, Morningside on Thursday, Dr. Michael Lake, Jamie Walden, Coach Dave Daubenmeyer, Pastor Casper McLeod, Sheila Zelinsky, Dave Hodges of the Common Sense Show, Thomas Dunn, and more. Uh, and we can save you 20 bucks on registration. Use promo code GILBERT20, GILBERT20 at hearthewatchmen.com. We've got a virtual conference coming up. This will be Skywatch TV's Defender Conference, The Unveiling, which launches May 13th on the web. All video presentations available for 90 days. Watch them in any order you like, as often as you like for 90 days. Presentations from uh, Tom Horn, Joel Richardson, uh, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn. Uh, we've got uh, Dr. Judd Burton, recent guest on this program, Pastor Carl Gallops, Colonel David Giamona, Tyler Gilreath, uh, many, many others. You can find the complete list of uh, speakers at 
DefenderConference.com and uh, sign up. Take advantage of the early bird discount, $10 off if you register by April 15th. And uh, again, that launches on the web at 12.01 a.m. Friday, May 13th. That's 12.01 a.m. Central Time here in the U.S., which will be UTC minus 5 then. Um, DefenderConference.com. In uh, May, we'll be in Colorado Springs for the uh, Homeward Bound Conference. Prophecy Watchers putting this together. Mondo Gonzalez, Gary Stearman, Bob Ulrich. We'll be there with Ellie Marzulli, um, Billy Crone, Dr. Ken Johnson, uh, Larry Allison, Nathan Jones, Dr. Randall Price, Terry James, Bill Salas, uh, Josh Peck will be there with us. So uh, quite a gathering. Uh, Ryan Peterson, who, by the way, will also be speaking at our uh, virtual conference. I should have mentioned him as well. Uh, just a great gathering. Uh, this will be at the Colorado Springs Marriott, May 19th through 22nd. Prophecy Watchers Homeward Bound Conference. More information and registration online at prophecywatchers.com. Uh, July, we're looking forward to this one. Uh, Southwest Radio Church is holding a conference at the Ark Encounter in Williamstown, Kentucky. This could be the coolest venue for a conference ever. Registration for this, just $29.99. Sharon and I will be speaking alongside our friends Larry Spargimino and uh, uh, Pastor James Collins, uh, Southwest Radio Church. Don't miss this one. Uh, if you've not seen the Ark Encounter, you need to. That boat is immense, much, much bigger than you think. Um, information and registration online, swrc.com, swrc.com. And then later in July, the Go Therefore, the Go Therefore Conference... Go Therefore Conference, uh, Pastor Mike Spaulding putting this together. This is July 29th through 31st at the Harvest Revival Center in Brookville, Ohio, just outside Dayton. Pastor Carl Gallops, Dr. Michael Lake, uh, David Hevener, Pastor Casper McLeod, Coach Dave, Kenny C., Thomas Dunn, and uh, more. Uh, and find more information online there at uh, gothereforeconference.com. And uh, finally, you might consider joining us in Turkey this October, October 18th through November 3rd. Sharon and I leading a tour of Turkey for Skywatch TV alongside Doug Hershey, author of the best-selling books Israel Rising and Jerusalem Rising. We'll see the cities of the seven churches of Revelation, Gobekli Tepe, the world's oldest religious community, and uh, influenced by the Watchers, according to Judd Burton and uh, Aaron Judkins. We'll visit the Asclepion of Pergamum, and then we'll go over to the Plutonion, the uh, gates of hell, where the god of the underworld was worshipped. We'll also visit uh, uh, Abraham's hometown of Haran and uh, many other sites. That, the incredible megalithic idols of Mount Nemrut. Um, man, you're just going to have to see the images because we're going to bring back lots of video and put it together into another travelogumentary. And uh, you can find out more at uh, skywatchinturkey.com. We're trying to keep this to a small tour, just a couple dozen at most. So if you're interested, check it out. The itinerary is there, and uh, you can reserve your spot, Skywatch in Turkey. Dot com. Thank you for making time for this uh, podcast or vidcast, wherever you're watching us. YouTube, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, Stitcher, wherever fine podcasts are sold. And we appreciate you giving us a like at our Facebook page. Our announcer is DC Good. And a view from the bunker is a production of Gilbert House, released under Creative Commons Attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 4.0 international license. We do this because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is a view from the bunker. Mm -hmm.